break is late this year. Um, it's very late, so there's not going to be much time when we get back. Um, and uh, I would take any questions you have about adjoint operators today. Um, or any of that stuff. Um, yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, yes. I think the thing is this: you would just apply the adjoint um, equation. Okay. So if I have if I have a, an orthonormal basis, okay, if I have EN is an ortho on 3, 9, number 10. Um, yes, I did. Well, unless I turn it on backwards. Maybe I turn it off. Yeah, it seems to be on. Is that verified? Okay. 3, 9, dash, uh, 3, 9 point 10. Okay, thank you. Um, they give you an orthonormal set, or basis, an orthonormal sequence, orthonormal sequence. Um, a total orthonormal sequence, in fact. En. Okay. In uh, separable Hilbert space. Well, okay, that means. If it was a separable Hilbert space, you could, by a previous exercise, which we did not do, you can construct a total orthonormal sequence by induction. Okay. That was an exercise we didn't do. Um, it would be kind of a good one, actually, to discuss. We have some more time. All right. Total orthonormal sequence in a separable Hilbert space. So they have a lot of... Hypotheses here that you're not going to have to use them all. I'm afraid. Okay, and then you can, in other words, in this context, you can go ahead and do it. Define this thing. All right. You find T of E n equals E n plus one. So that's called the right shift. Now, um, so what do you? What do you think? I mean, you're going to have some kind of adjoint operation, right? You have T E N, inner product E N plus 1. That's equal to 1, right? Yeah. So now put down to the adjoint, that gives you the E N T star E N plus 1 is equal to 1. Okay. But you also know that uh, T, E, N, inner product, anything else, E, K, for K unequal to N, is equal to 0. Excuse me, K unequal to N plus 1 is equal to 0. Okay, so you also know, therefore, that E, N, T star, E, K, for anything is equal to 0, for K unequal to N plus 1. So that tells you what T star does, basically, right? That tells, that tells you rigorously, you know that T star, that you know what T star does, because you know that T star uh, could act on anything of the form alpha K, E K. K goes from 1 to infinity because the set is orthonormal. So every X, for all X in H, uh, X equals summation alpha K E K. K goes from 1 to infinity with some sequence alpha K squared finite. All right. X can be represented this way by the hypothesis that you had a total orthonormal set or sequence. This implies this. Okay. So you can represent every x that way. So therefore, you're able to calculate t star on anything by using this data. And it's obvious to guess now what it does. All right?
because it's bounded, therefore it's continuous, therefore I can take the infinite sum outside. We know that T, we assume that T was bounded itself. To be the linear operator, well, you can easily prove that T is bounded. You need to do that first. First, show that T is bounded. It's obvious that T is bounded and T has a norm one. Okay? So need to step. Steps are, there are fer, very many steps. Steps, T is bounded with norm one. You can easily show, and then that's step one. Two uh, is this is this thing statement here that I made. Okay, three is all of this. Okay, once you have a bounded linear operator, then you can talk about the adjoint. Okay, four is this. Okay, and then you're pretty much done. Okay, then you just identify everything. Okay. You could do steps. Yeah, you need. You could do steps two and three in reverse. They're, they're, they're not. This is not the optimal order. But you just have to do step one first. Okay. You need to set up the adjoint. You need, you need to have a bounded linear operator in order to say that I've got this adjoint. Okay. Okay. So the fact they throw in separable is not going to be used, other than to. It would be consistent with the condition that was. Ne I think it's necessary if you got a total orthonormal sequence and the super space has to be separable. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think that's one of the theorems in there. Okay. Yeah. Um. I don't know, 3, 8, number 7, I don't know the second half of it, but I do think I ended up just like with this inner product of an inner product, I didn't know what to do with it. Oh, three eight number seven. Oh, okay. Um, yes, this, I make some comments about this, perhaps. Though I wasn't going to actually do the problem. Um, um, you you know that um, three eight number seven. You have that. What you know is that, if, so you've got a Hilbert space H given. All right, Hilbert space. And, and it is supposedly, and the, with the inner product, the usual no notation on it, just like that. Okay, so the, that's on the original Hilbert space. Now let f be an h prime, that is, f is a bounded linear functional. You know by the Reese theorem, what they didn't call it that, by 3.8-1, how to represent f. Represent f by 3.8-1 as f equals f sub z equals inner product of x, f of x equals f sub z of x equals inner product of x with z. Maybe we should make that bigger. So in other words, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the elements of h and the elements of h prime. <laughs> That's what 3.8-1, it gives you a one-to-one -one correspondence. There's an H, and there's H prime. Here is Z here, corresponds to F sub Z equals the function which is the inner product with Z, okay? F sub Z dot, okay? In other words, that's the function, the, linear, the element of H prime, the linear functional. Okay? The fu it's a function on H, means it's an element of H prime. So this is an element of H prime. Z in H corresponds to this. We said for every Z in H you get one of these, which is a bounded linear functional. Okay? 
And conversely, given a bonded linear functional that's written this way in a unique way, there's only one z that gives you this bonded linear functional. Okay? So that's a one-to-one -one correspondence that's given you now. Um, now all you need to verify, indeed, is that um, that h prime um, that this this is a set of linear functionals. So that's as a vector space. Okay, you've got this. But now I want to show that there's an inner product on that vector space. Okay, in other words, I want to show that the norm is given by an inner product. Uh, so yeah, so okay, here's the point. It's not only a norm, it's a norm space. H prime is a norm space, we said, right? H prime is a norm space, because that's the theory from section 2.10. H was a uh, norm space, so H prime is a Bonnock space, with nor with okay, with norm uh, given by the the, op, the operator norm f sub z, okay, which we know is equal to the norm of z, okay. To show that indeed this norm is given by an inner product is shown. This norm. is actually given by an inner product which we'll call inner product sub 1 on H prime. Okay. In other words, you get a norm space by operator norm. Okay. We already know that from section 2.10. We want to show that, that H prime is not only a Bonnock space, it's a Hilbert space. Okay? Bonnock space with an inner product is a Hilbert space because it's already complete in this norm. I just want to show that this norm is actually comes from an, some inner product on a, a structure on this vector space. So I need to establish that. Now, how do I establish that? Well. You need to verify that the inner product that they give you, uh, written down there, actually does the job. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now you would say, doesn't that make H, H, H prime is therefore a Hilbert space, right? H is a Hilbert space, so isn't H prime just equal to isomorphic to H? And if you look in the definition, you'll see the answer is no, because the inner product is reversed. They got f sub z inner product f sub v equals the inner uh, in the one they sh to show. Okay, show that this does the job. Show that f sub z inner product f sub v um, sub one by definition equal to the inner product of V with Z does the job to make H prime that already has a norm okay it already has a norm because it's a dual space it's, its norm is given automatically Right. into a Hilbert space. Now you say, well, if I've got a Hilbert space and it's one-to-one -one, uh, mapping with another Hilbert space, and I've got an inner product, you know, all this stuff, well, doesn't that make it two isomorphic Hilbert spaces? No. Because the isomorphism condition, if you look back, when you define isomorphic Hilbert spaces, which was in uh, section 3.2, I believe, where they snuck that in there, I didn't really cover it. Isomorphism between two Hilbert spaces is that you um, have an isometric isomorphism that preserves the order of the inner product. So you need to have 
uh, TX, TY equal to XY. Okay, so I've got a mapping T here, T going forward, let's say, one to one onto, going from Z to F sub Z, all right, which, and then I've got this inner product over here, but you reverse the order, the V and the Z. Okay, here at F sub Z is the corresponds to Z, F sub V corresponds to V in this mapping, but then I flip the sides in this inner product. So that only true if it's a real space there? A real uh, Hilbert space? Yeah, then if it was a real Hilbert space, then they would be isomorphic. Okay. But um, but so so then only in general for the complex Hilbert space, if you do it again then, the double dual, you get to switch it again. So problem eight following and the answers in the notes as well. I was going to cover it today. Then if you go to the double dual, then you flip it again. Okay, so then you do get isomorphism. So H and H double prime are equal in Hilbert spaces. So that's the reflexivity of the Hilbert space. <clears throat> so that's kind of interesting uh, application. So you need to verify that indeed uh, this gives the norm. Let me just check my notes, make sure if there's anything I'm missing about what you need. That's what you need to do and see if I'm missing anything in terms of uh, subtlety here. What do I do with my homework solution? Uh, I stuck it in some other notebook. Okay, I don't have it with me. Okay. I can't. Uh, well, I mean, officially, all I'd have to do is uh, verify that this is an inner product. Okay. I need to verify this does work as an inner product, right? This verify, verify. That if I call this star, verify star does def does give an inner product. In other words, this okay on a so it goes through the inner product axioms one two three four. IP one check IP one two four one. I think it's one through four. I can't remember if they used Roman numerals. I guess they didn't. Probably just call it one through four. All right. Okay. And then two, check, verify, that's one. And then two, verify that, um, that, the, that F sub Z, F sub Z, equals, well this is trivial then, the norm of fz squared is equal to z squared. Okay, <laughs> okay. You need to check that because that's the norm, right? That's trivial. So it's almost done. Okay. Maybe I don't have to do what I was trying to do then. I was trying to derive it, I guess. You know, you might ask, well is this the only inner product you know, this is the only inner product that would uh, make H prime into a Hilbert space. You know, because you want to say, well, it's really not isomorphic no matter how you do it. Uh, but uh, I think we'll just beg off of that question. Okay? All right. I just have one really quick question. Yes. The last one. T to the n is T of T of T of T, right? Yes. T times T. Yeah. But I can give you a slight hint on that one if you want. Do you, need, do you want hints? <laughs> I mean, the basic thing is, okay, here, here's the basic thing. You're going to have enough trouble with the last problem anyway. So the previous problem is not that easy either, but, but some stuff from 3.9, but 3.10 uh, but uh, dash, I forgot what it was, 6 or something. 310.6, you, you say you assume that um, T is not equal to the zero operator, that T is bounded in self adjoint. Self adjoint. Right? 
and you want to show the first show that t squared is not equal to zero. Okay? Not equal to the zero operator. You want to show that t to the, the t to the n could never be to the zero operator. There's a lot of little playing games here. Okay, so, so assume you had the bounded self adjoint operator, linear operator. Okay, so bounded linear goes without saying, okay, practically. Now, so, so there exists an X in your, Hel in your Hilbert space. We're assuming X is on, T is mapping Hilbert space back to itself. Yes. There exists X and H so that TX is not equal to zero. TX belongs to H, right? So you can apply T again, obviously. Okay? Okay. All right. So if that's true, then I claim that you can show the T squared. Let me just show that T squared of X is not equal to zero. Claim T squared of X is not equal to zero. And then you get the basic idea. How would you show that t squared of x is unequal to zero? He says first show for uh, that t to the n is, as an operator is unequal to zero. Well, I'll just show that t to the squared is not equal to zero as an operator if I can show one element is not equal to zero. And that's the whole. Key. The key is just to stick with this one x, right? Just stick with the one x, and it's easy to see. Because um, what I do is I just go ahead to prove that's not equal to zero. Um, I know. What do I know? I know that zero is not equal to the norm of tx, right? So that's the norm square. Zero less than. Okay. I know this actually. I know by the previous this, right? And then you go on from there. So, uh, now how can you go on from there? Well, use the adjoint. <laughs> okay, use the adjoint, use it as self adjoint. Now, and then, okay. Okay, so that's a non zero quantity. All right, well, that means x can't be zero. We already knew that. But this other side couldn't be zero either. If the other side was zero, you have a contradiction. Okay, that's the basic step. And then, uh, so, but you still have to finish the rest of the problem. Okay. <laughs> Which takes a little bit of head scratching. Okay. All right. Okay. So now that we discussed this thing with the 3.8.7, I think I will not, I will not discuss 3.8.8, .8, the second double. It's in the notes now, and uh, you can follow that, I think. I'm going to read that. Or discuss the second double. Uh, okay. Questions? Those are good problems. And there's another good problem on the exam. <laughs> okay. The last problem on the exam is of the same, same kind of flavor. Only um, there's one. Oh, you had to show that the T star inverse is the. In other words, you had to do something like this T star inverse. This is not that easy of a problem. At least not the way I was looking at it. Okay. You had to show this one, right? You did it in two lines? Okay. Very good. Well, it must not be that hard then. You can get it two lines, but I think you have to use one of these lemmas or something like that. I, I don't have my notes, but uh, yeah. But again, you're going to have to. Uh, I think the basic technique is is to use that um, the lemma. This is on a complex silver space, right? Was this for a complex silver space? I don't know if they specified on that. Three point nine number two. That B L H B O show this. Okay, it's not. Why should you bond linear operators? Inverse is bounded. How do you show equality of operators? 
That's, that's the hint I believe you're going to need to use that, the zero operator lemma. Okay, so he didn't show this. Um, he didn't show this as one of the properties uh, in 3.9 dash 4 because he was talking about. He didn't talk about if you assume you had an invertible operator from H to H. So he left it to the exercise. So similar as to the proof style of 3.9 dash 4, I believe. I believe. Okay, like that. I don't know if you need more than that, but you need to verify that you have some kind of that if, that you'll get the, you know, that you have two two operators the same, if only if the difference is the zero operator. Okay. Uh, using uh, 3.9-3a, you don't have to use the fact that you have a complex silver space. Okay because you don't have a complex silver space, <laughs> okay? So you don't get to use 3.9-3b. So it gives you some hints. It's pretty much like 3.9-4, I believe. All right, it looks easy enough, but that's what you, I think you should follow that. I'm, again, I'm not 100% because I don't have my solution on me right here. Sorry about that. Okay. Just using pure logic and what I could figure out so far. Okay. All right, have a good time with those. It tends to be almost it tends to be pretty computational this one. Uh, putting some of your theorems together a little bit. Okay. All right, so I think I'm going to go on because, like I said, we're, we're running through half the course now, and uh, I want to get a little bit of uh, today and then next week finish up all this Han Bonnach theorem stuff so you'll have perhaps next week you can even ask me some questions about that stuff. Um, so, yeah, are you going to have any homework too next week? No, you don't have any homework due next week. So you don't have homework due for like three weeks. Well, we have homework due on Tuesday, right? You have one due on Tuesday. Yeah, this one. But you're not going to have anything from Chapter 4 due until you break. Right, you have the test, and then you don't have any Chapter 4 homework. So I'm going to have gobs of time. I have five lectures to get into Chapter 4 before you go on break. So you better watch out. <laughs> okay. We're going to use up a whole nother, you know, 15% of the course. We'll be like that. Okay. So, um, okay. In the next five lectures. So, uh, you may ask me some questions about your test as well, and we can have some question and answer periods, but this was pretty much it for this whole part. And that's the end of Chapter 3. So now we're into Chapter 4. And I'll give you some new homework assignments. You should probably be thinking about those before the break, for sure. So we can get a, you know, get those in. Okay. Because the Thursday before the break, you'll have already turned your test in. You should be asking about those questions. So two weeks from today. It'll be the Thursday. The, yeah. The new homework, whatever it is, hasn't been assigned yet. But I will do that over the weekend. So. Okay. All right. So. It, we're going to enter a new topic, so we'll need a little extra time because we're going to have Zorn's Lemma. But you should at least, I think, it's, as long as you're going to learn Zorn's Lemma, you might as well learn it right and, and understand what a partially ordered set is, even though you're not going to really need to know anything about partially ordered sets or Zorn's Lemma per se. I think it's interesting just to sort of take a side street and just have a look at it, um, as long as we're going to go ahead and state Zorn's Lemma. We were just getting a talk today in the colloquium using axiom of choice, which is equivalent to Zorn's lemma, and has all these wonderful uh, theorems that have very elegant solutions using the Zorn's lemma that many of these theorems have now been, or some of the direction these theorems were showing, have been proved without the axiom of choice in the context of the uh, number theory, combinatorial number theory. Uh, but some of the general results that were used to elegantly prove some things about combinatorial number theory. In the subject of combinatorial number theory, use axiom of choice. So there's some really beautiful theorems 
I have to use it in real analysis too, and then in my algebra class, we're going to go through it next week. We're going to have to use it for quite a bit of our homework yeah. class. Yeah, I think what it does is it just it shows. <laughs> Sometimes, I mean, it's just, it's an elegant usage, okay? It's an elegant thing that, that kills a lot of things off and uh, not that things can't be done the other way for most, for many applications and do quantitatively, but this is going to be more of an existence type theorem. We're saying, okay, there's going to exist a Hamel basis. What is a Hamel basis? It's a very strange thing if you think about it because you think of trying, making a basis, uh, you think of, a basis for infinite dimensional space, you're going to have to use infinitely many basis vectors, right? To represent. But the Hamel basis means that any element will be represented as a finite sum. So it's a linearly independent sum, uh, set. A Hamel basis in a vector space is a linearly independent set. It means every, every finite subset is a linearly independent set, okay? That's how you define an infinite set. To be linearly independent it means every finite subset is linearly independent. So. So it's a strange thing. Hamel basis would be a linearly independent set uh, of, a, of a vector space. For finite dimensions, it's no big deal. Okay, Linearly independent set <coughs> This is back in section 2.1. They actually gave the definition, but we kind of skipped it at that time. All right, remember when we were doing the PC tablet <laughs> or whatever that was called? Okay, literally dependent set. And um, uh, B, I guess you could call it, means every finite subset is linearly independent. That spans, let's call the vector space X. That spans X means the set of all finitely new combinations is equal to X. The span of B equals the set of all finitely new combinations I'll just write this finite linear combinations. of elements of B. Okay, that means that, well, if you've got this Hamel basis, that means anything in X can be written as a, in a unique way, as a finite linear combination of the elements from this basis. So no infinite sums. So it's kind of counterintuitive. We'd rather have the shouter basis, it seems like, you know, where you get the infinite sum, and that's the, that's the element. Okay? So in other words, take the closure of the finite linear combinations of a countable, you know, collection of basis vectors or something like that. And that's your, that's your, <laughs> that's your basis. That seems a little bit more natural to me. But this one is also around, and the theorem that follows from the Zorn's lemma is that every vector space has a Hamel basis. So you say, what the heck is that thing looking like? You're not going to construct this thing. Just try to think about it for L infinity or something and say, there's no way I can construct one. Okay? So it's a, you know, kind of like it's there, but what is it? I have no idea. Okay? So you can get some value out of these existence type theorems, um, though this one's not clear what the value is. But we are going to get then the Hanbonic theorem, and that's going to be proved in stages. The most general versions that we want is in about four different versions as we go through sections 4.2 and 4.3. We're just going to keep bumping it up. And the very first one is where we use the Zorn's Lemma. Okay? So it does have application. Now he says, can we get away with the Zorn's Lemma at the end of section 4.2? He has a little section there, so it's worthwhile reading. And he says, I think he basically says in this, uh, let's see, what does he say? Can we get away with it? Uh, then he says, well, in certain cases, yes, we could have done, we could do a more constructive thing. Okay. But I think the point of view is that, uh, well, it's more elegant the way we did it here. 
So in other words, there's this, this trade-off of elegance, easy to quit, okay, versus ugly and quantitative, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it has its role. Let's just put it that way. There's it has its role. You have to use it for, right? Aren't there some things that you can't do without it? Or maybe not just in this course, but I mean in general. Are there, aren't there some things that... I'm not fully aware. All I know is that mathematicians, you know, say they always notice when you used it. Yeah. Okay? Okay. <laughs> you used it. Okay, that's fine, but, you know... We, there's always an industry of then can I do it without it okay and is and that usually provides another fruitful direction okay so it's such a, a tool that is very valuable but it's like all right um, is there another way okay I don't know how to how to represent it it's a certain tool in your toolbox that you probably have to use in certain areas okay realistically um, but um, but there's always an interest in doing it other ways, okay, which leads to other, you know, discussions and so on. So it's an interesting, you know, is there a way between the worlds, so to speak, of the axiom of choice and not the axiom of choice? Okay. You got a paper and you're trying to get it published and you've used it, are they going to frown on it? No. No. It's Fine. Not necessarily. Let's say, could, have you done, had, could you do it without it, okay? Or that you will mention that you did use it. In certain areas, it's just going to be uh, just like... Of course you used it. Yeah. You used the Hanbanak theorem. Okay. <laughs> so I'm not that well enough familiar with the subject uh, to really help you with that. I'm sure, and there are analysts who are, and I'm certainly, I'm just not one of them, okay, that knows all the ins and outs of that particular business. I'm just going to introduce it to you now, okay? So I apologize a little bit about that. <laughs> okay. What's the idea? Well, like what you said, yeah, they don't think about it too much. They use it when they need to, and they don't yeah. think about it all the time. Yeah, it's good mathematics. Yeah. And you'll see some really nice theorems, okay? They use it, okay? And so you'll say, well, there's no problem with that. I love that theorem, okay? And then you'll see, you know, that it spawned, you know, interesting other results, you know? So I don't think there's any question about it that it's definitely part of the mathematical world. Okay. We're not going to talk about the continuous hypothesis. No. Not that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a, a set theorist. Okay, let's talk about a partial order on a set M. That's a very simple thing, really, is a relation. I don't know if you learned about relations when you took discrete math. I'm going to call it R because I did take at least teach discrete math once. <laughs> a relation is simply a, uh, a subset of the Cartesian product. Okay, more general than a function. A relation is more general than a function. It's just a set of ordered pairs, where each of the coordinates is an element of the set. Okay, good. Everybody's nodding. This satisfies. The diagonal is in the re in this relationship for every a and m. Uh, that's one, two, uh, a, b, and b, a in the relationship means um, implies that a equals to b. And three, a, b, and a, c in R implies that AC is in R. Okay, so what does this mean in terms of less than or equal to signs? And sometimes they make a special thing. This means that A, so this relationship is the less than or equal to relationship. It means A is less than or equal to A for all A and M. Okay? This means that A less or equal to B and B less or equal to A implies that B is equal to A. All right, and this last one means that if I have a less or equal to b and b less or equal to c, then a is less or equal to c. Okay, and sometimes I use a different kind of less than or equal to sign, a fancy looking thing, you know, like this or something like that. 
All right? That's typical. All right? But here, the author's not going to mess with such fonts. All right? Uh, there's no... We're not going to do the uh, the strictly less thing. Okay? Well, if A is less than or equal to B and A not equal to B, then we're talking about strict inequality. But he's not going to get into strict inequality. So if, they're, if, they're, if it's less than or equal to and not equal to, then that's strict inequality. Okay? That's all it is. All right? So what are some examples? So, so, not it, so, so in particular, a totally ordered set. Okay, what's a totally ordered set? M is totally ordered. Means, for, it means it's partially ordered. Means um, every, for every two elements, A and B in M, either A is less than or equal to B or B is less than or equal to A. So every two elements would be or B is less than or equal to A. That's a definition. So the real numbers, an example. Any subset of the real numbers, okay. With the usual less than or equal to, all right, is totally ordered. Um, but in a partially ordered situation, it's certainly not required. We're not expecting it to be, all right. So there are plenty of elements that are not related one way or the other. Give me an example there. Complex numbers, very good. Complex numbers are R2, which is the same structure. Okay, so if I take R2, C, or R2, I'll just say, I'll just take, I'll just focus on this one. Okay, X in R2 is going to be written as C1, oops, can't write my C today, C1, C2, small wonder, and Y in R2, also written uh, A to 1, A to 2. Then x less than or equal to y defined x less than or equal to y means what do you think that should mean? What's the usual one? Uh, C1 is less than or equal to a to 1, yeah. And C2 less than or equal to a to 2. Okay. So all elements less than or equal to a given element, what would that look like? So what's the set of all? If I pick a number like 1, 1, what's all elements less than or equal to that? Be everything down here. This is the set of all x, set of all x in R2 such that x is less than or equal to 1, 1. Okay, I can always talk about the set of all elements less than or equal to, but there's plenty of elements are not related, right? You have to be x and y related if and only if uh, y is northeast of x or x is northeast of y or vice versa to do with southwest, <laughs> okay? All right, so one has to be over and above the other, okay, to be less than or equal to, all right? So if I take one, if I take an element in the third quadrant in particular, an element in, excuse me, the second quadrant and the fourth quadrant, they're not related, unless they're on the x-axis or y-axis. Okay? Both on the x-axis or both on the y-axis. All right? Good. But you would both say both of those are greater than or equal to them? Huh? If they're above or not to the right, but they're not above and to the right. Okay. Uh, it's, just, it's just a less than or equal to thing. So, if, so for example, one two, one one is less than or equal to one. One one is less than or equal to one two. I'm not going to talk about strictly less. I'm just not going to bother in this discussion. Okay. So this is this is less than or equal to, but obviously strictly less relationship. Okay. Okay. So one two is also greater than or equal to everything in this set. 
Okay, so we call one one is an upper bound of this set. One two is an upper bound of this set. So if I call this set W, okay, which is a subset of R two, then I call one one is an upper one one is an upper bound of W. And one two is an upper bound of W. And obviously, in this case, one one is a least upper bound. In this case, a least upper bound exists. Okay? That is actually in W. Okay? So I could have defined W by the strict less than, then it wouldn't have been in W. Okay. So, so you may have upper bounds, you may have least upper bounds, so and things like that. Point? Zero two, we don't discuss that. Or Zero two? Yeah. Okay, that's 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 certainly a point. Okay, it's not an upper bound of this set because it's not greater than or equal to this point over here. All right, it's not an upper bound. So zero two is not an upper bound of W. So upper bound means, let's go ahead and make the definition. We only have about three definitions to do. You have the definition of the partially ordered set, you have the definition of upper bound, and you have the definition of maximal element. So there's only one more. But let's have this upper bound. Okay? Um, so my, my superset is M. My partially ordered set is partially ordered set is M in this discussion. Now, note that automatically any subset of a partially ordered set is automatically a partially ordered set with the same less than or equal to sign. Just like very similar to any subset of a metric space is, again, a metric space with the same metric. It's the same thing. So uh, this W is a, met is a partially ordered set in its own right. <coughs> okay? Either two elements are related or they ain't. Okay? Okay. But I'm going to, in my discussion of this definition, I'm going to start with my superset is going to be capital M. And then a, an upper bound of a subset W in M is any element little m in the big set. So you don't have to be, the upper bound doesn't have to be from the subset. So that uh, W is less or equal to M for all W in W. Okay, so that there is, it is bigger than everything. So everything in W is related to M. Everything in W is related to this little m, okay? And is of the form less than or equal to. Little w is less than or equal to M. So that was the situation here. So that's why this 0, 2 was not an upper bound, because in particular, uh, any point over in this square here, in the first quadrant, was not related to 0, 2. There's, there's no relationship, so in particular, not less than or equal to. All right? Likewise, the point two zero. Likewise, the point two zero is not an upper bound. Okay. These points as well. Okay. Or these points. Actually, it was these points and these points. I, I missed some of them. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So not, zero two is not related to anything in this whole strip here. Okay, and two zero is not related to anything in this whole strip. Two two is an upper bound. Two two is an upper bound. Yeah, yeah. Yes, very good. All right, so you're checking. All those are good to upper bounds. All right, one two is kind of. You can't make the x coordinate any less than one. Right. And you can't make the y coordinate any less than one. Okay, there's two conditions. So all the upper bounds are in this upper sector here, this northeast sector. Okay, all the upper bounds are in there. All those are upper bounds. So one one is the soup. Oh, uh, is the soup of this? Yes, it is uh, this in this case there is the least upper bound. There exists the least upper bound. You're not guaranteed to, guaranteed to have least upper bounds in this situation. But if there is one, there's a problem that says it must be unique. Oh. By Zorn's lemma. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so that's problem number eight from section 4.1. But I'm going to have you do for problem number six from section 4.1. So you can have a look ahead if you want. I think I'll have you do four and six. I'm just going to be doing four and six because eight is a repeat, basically. Once you've done six, you've done eight. Okay.
So I'm going to have you do four, which is basically just a little baby example, and then six, which is where you're going to have to apply Zorn's lemma. So 4.1, number four, I didn't get that far, and six. This is how you apply Zorn's, okay? All right, here. And this is just an example, a finite example, so you can't have any problem there. All right, and number eight was, is a... Is a an apple is an immediate consequence of six. And number nine tells you the answer to number eight. So I didn't tell you okay. those problems. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Four, six, eight, and nine. Okay? This implies eight, and nine gives answer to eight. All right. So those are your problems. But anyway, I'll just make those. These are going to be the ones that I'm going to make do. Okay? Upper bot. Okay, what else? Okay, so let's have another example. Um, I'm going to, he, t he gives some more general examples in the book. He gives some general examples in the book, but I want to make mine more specific. I'm going to take a particular context that happens all the time, and that is where this partially ordered thing really uh, is natural when you're talking about sets. Sets can be nasty and wild. Okay, big. Okay, and the basic partial order is going to be inclusion, set inclusion. All right, and one set may not be included in another set. They may not have any relationship, inclusion-wise. Right? They just overlap. Okay, but if they do inclusion, all right, then you have the less than or equal to. So let's do M equal a set of sets. Let's take the null set. Let's take uh, singleton one, the singleton two, the singleton three, the uh, doubleton one two, the doubleton one three and the doubleton 2, 3. Okay, so here is a, here is a set. Its elements are itself sets, but that's okay. All right? So it's a set with elements A, B, you know, capital A, capital B. Um, it's not quite the power set. M is the power set minus one thing equals the power set. Power set of the set 1, 2, 3 minus the single set, one, two, three. Okay. <laughs> minus the singleton. Okay? I have to put double sets here because this is the element is one is the set one, two, three. Okay? That's an element. So I have to subtract off the singleton set consisting of one element. Alright. Um, the power set is just all subsets. All right. I don't know if you remember that from discrete math. Maybe not. Anyway, it would have two to the third number of subsets, which would be eight. Here I've only listed seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. I wanted to do that because I didn't want to have uh, a unique maximal element. Okay. One, two. This set one, two, three is bigger than everything else, obviously. Okay. So I didn't want that. So I'll take it away to make a more interesting example. So what are some chains? What's a chain? So, so a, is, a is less than or equal to B means uh, AB in elements of the capital M means A is a subset of B. Okay? That's what it means. So less than or equal to means subset in this context. So well, there's lots of things, right? But there's lots of things that aren't related. Obviously, these two subsets are not related. All right? But uh, any one of the singletons is a subset of any of the doubletons, okay? No, it's not true either. I'm sorry. It has to be of an appropriate doubleton. <laughs> any of the singletons is a subset of, of two of the doubletons, okay? But not the third one, all right? Mm -hmm. Got to be really careful, all right? So with this business, in terms of making missteps, is easy to do. Um, any examples? So... You know, I might have made this more of a script M in this case to say it's a set of sets. Sometimes that would be a little bit more natural to make it, you know, um, you know, if I'm talking about a set of sets, I'll sometimes use script M, you know, to say that's a, because the elements are sets, okay? That might be a little bit more natural for you if you want to, all right? So not using the same kind of letters for elements and space. Normally use the little x and the capital X, right? The element of a space, okay? <clears throat> um, so what do I want to show? What's a chain? 
A chain is any a chain C is any totally ordered subset. Is well-ordered the same as totally ordered or partially ordered, or is it neither? Of them. What's uh, well-ordered? What's well-ordering principle? I don't remember. (laughs) (laughs) Does anybody remember? That's what Royden used, and I was just trying to remember because I had to do something. I think well-ordering is between any two reels is another reel. Something like that. Uh, it's something simple. You might want to look it up. It's this isomorphic to that something has a maximal element. They're the same. Okay. Well, why don't we answer those next time? Okay. It's not in this book. Okay. Let's bring in the well ordering thing. All right. <laughs> next time. So let's talk about just partial orders right now. Um, <coughs> So C is totally ordered. C is a chain C is a totally ordered subset. So that could be just any interval, for example, in the real line, finite or infinite. Okay. So chains can be sort of small, or they can be bigger. Right? <coughs> they can get bigger and bigger chains. Okay. Just everything. So in other words, every element is related to every other. So it's, it's like a, it's like a, I don't know. Maybe I think of it like a curve or a line. Um, but it could be bigger. Uh, well, they, that's what I'm thinking of in R2, because I'm just thinking, just take a curve that goes up and to the right and think all the elements along there. Okay, this one is less than equal to this one, less than equal to this one, less than equal to all these are less than equal to, like that. Okay? In R2. Um, so this is my C, <laughs> okay, for a chain. Okay, or a curve if you like it. Okay. But if I take, you know, going down to the, if I, but if I take this one, that's definitely not a chain. If I take L equals this line, uh, C2 equals minus C1. L equals the set C2 of X in R2 such that C2 equals minus C1. That's not a chain, okay? Because... Nobody is related to anybody else except A is equal to A, all right? So this is a subset of R2, is not a chain. In fact, no two elements are related to one another if they're different. A unequal to A and B in L, A unequal to B uh, are not related. Well, if A and B are in L, and A is unequal to B, then A and B are unrelated. So the only, only you have the trivial relationship, okay? The diagonal, right? A equal to A for every A in L. Right. Only, nothing more. So it's not totally ordered. It's far from. It's just the opposite. Okay. Totally not ordered. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Which is not that interesting. All right. But it's it's just it's a point that you still have this thing. Okay. Um. Okay. Totally ordered subset. So, what are some chains? Chains in, chains, some chains in uh, the script M example. All right? Then I have zero is a subset of one, is a subset of one, two. That's a chain. And I can't go any further. All right? Or I could have gone in a different direction. I could have gone zero, subset of one, subset of one, three. Okay, there's a different chain, right? My curve could have gone this way, or it could have gone that way, right? There's some, lots of curves that can come out. Or I can have a uh, z- null set as a subset of 2 is a subset of 2, 3. 
it's a chain in a different, you know, starting with a, starting with a different direction. Okay. Okay. So those are chains. So the, the set of elements, the C is null set one, one, two. That's my C. Or the C, a different C is null set two, two, three. So it's a set of elements. Is that clear? Then just. Can you make like trivial chains where it's just like a single element? No, oh, yeah, that's a trivial chain. Yeah, it's a trivial chain. A is also equal to A. It's totally ordered. Okay. Okay. So that's not a big. That's not a big thing. Um, okay. So what the, his point was that you can ex there can exist. Um, um, that there exist uh, subsets that have no upper bounds. This one has this this L has no upper bound. Right? Because you're going to have to have the x coordinate go to infinity because of the line going down to the right. And you have the y coordinate to be infinity because of the line going up to the, to the top. So any upper bound has to be infinity, which is not going to be in the space, let's assume. Okay? Let's not put infinity, infinity in there. Okay? So there's no upper bound in this case. There would be if I could throw in that infinity, infinity. All right? So there's, there's no upper bound. Yet, uh, okay, what's a maximal element? Okay. What's a maximal element? A maximal element is that there's no larger element than it. Okay. Now, in R2, there are no maximal elements. Because there's no point that I take in R2 that it's not somebody bigger, right? So the maximal element is just that so you can't get bigger than me, okay? You can't be bigger than me. So what's, there are three maximal elements in script M. This is a maximal element, that's a maximal element, and that's a maximal element. Okay, there are three maximal elements. Maximal element. Elements. One, two, and three. I'll just do it that way. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, what's the definition? Maximum. I said I need one more definition. Maximal element. Um, is uh, of 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 the partially ordered set M. Okay, I'm going to say I'm going to start with this partial order set M. That's my superspace. Um, is that it's an element, is an element, little m and capital M, so that if little x purports to be bigger than it, okay, then x can only be equal to it. Okay? So there's no x bigger than m, okay? Okay. <laughs> All right. So m is not less than anything. All right. <coughs> there does not exist x in m with x bigger than m. In other words, if we use a strict inequality, okay? Okay, so those are some maximal elements, and there's no maximal element R2. What about in this, this weird example, L, though? I claim that every element is maximal. Okay, there's no one bigger than that in the set. So if I consider L as a partially ordered set in its own right, a trivial one, obviously, then all the elements are... If I take only the diagonal for my relationship, all right, AA is in the... AA has to be in the relationship. If I take the smallest possible relation, okay, on the set, then, then every element is maximal. Okay. There's no one bigger than A. <laughs> There's nobody there. Nobody home. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Um, so that's a trivial example that I just pointed out. What's Zorn's Lemma? Zorn's Lemma... 
says this. What's what's what should it say? Okay, Zorn's lemma. Suppose every chain C of a non-empty partially ordered set M. So M is unequal to zero, unequal to no set. It's you know obviously okay. I'm not going to take that. All right. Has least upper bound. Has an upper bound. Not a least upper bound. Has an upper bound in M. Okay, that would be the case. For example, in the uh, well, it wouldn't be the case in the real line. Okay, in the real line, I could take the infinite interval or the real line itself. Okay, that's a chain. It has an upper bound. Okay, so we're not in that context. Right, but if I took, um, if I take my partially ordered set, um, just the closed unit interval zero to one, or something like that, or a set that was bounded above, okay, as my partially ordered set, then I would have the, the uh, well, where there was a last element. Okay, if I took um, a, a, a subset of R that had a highest element. Then I'm in this case. All right. R does not work. M equals R doesn't work. Doesn't doesn't satisfy hypothesis. I didn't state this conclusion yet. Okay. Um, uh, M equals a subset of R with a largest element does. So I have to have the largest element included. So if I took the open interval 0, 1, that doesn't work. Okay, because there's no set as my M. Okay, so just, just to point out, what, just make double, you know, sort of check the hypothesis. Okay, if I have this, suppose every chain of a non-empty partially ordered set M has an upper bound in M. Okay, then, uh, M has a maximal element. So what's the idea of what's the idea behind it? What's the idea behind it? Um, take the longest chain, so to speak. Just make your chain as long as possible, okay? And since it has an upper bound, the longest chain has an upper bound, right? So if I can somehow construct the longest chain, it itself has an upper bound, according to the hypothesis, because it's a chain. Okay? If every chain is an upper bound, take, take it, the longest chain in a given direction. And it may not be all, the only chain you have, but just keep, if you've got a chain, then make it bigger, right, if you can. If you can't make it bigger, it's already the longest. Okay? Then make it bigger and bigger and bigger. Make the biggest chain you can do, then it has an upper bound, so that's, the maximum, that's a maximal element. You can prove easily that's a maximal element. Okay? Nobody can be bigger than it. Okay? If you could, then you could have made the chain bigger. Okay? So that's the basic idea. That's it. <laughs> okay. I mean, what else is there to say? That'll prove it. <laughs> okay? That uses this axiom of choice. So it's sort of the intuitive thing. It's, you know, in this sort of gray area. You know, there's no construction. Right? Yeah, I've seen something like a choice function. Yeah. Yeah. So you can try to make this thing. Um, you can try to make this thing rigorous, but you have to make it an axiom, basically. So this is our axiom at that level. Okay. And it gives you that every vector space has a Hamel basis. How would you do that? Okay. Uh, you would take linearly independent. All possible linear. You give yourself a space vector space X. It's a given vector space, like L infinity or what have you. Okay. Right. All all uh, vector spaces have a hammer basis application. All vector spaces 
have a Hamel basis. You have to check the hypothesis. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to set up Zorn's lemma. Let x is your space, vector space. D is a linearly independent subset. We'll assume that x is not equal to zero, otherwise it's trivial. Okay? So, so M is going to be the collection of all linearly independent subsets B. And what's going to be the uh, partial order? It's going to be inclusion. Less than or equal to means inclusion. Subset. Okay? So, okay, does every um, chain have a least upper bound? The claim is yes. If I take the U, if I take, if C is a chain, okay, then take the union of all the bases B, or all the linearly independent subsets, I should call them L or something, I call them B instead, B in, in C. That I can, I can always take the union of an arbitrary collection of sets. That's one of our rules of set theory, I guess. Okay, you can always take that. That's going to be linearly independent. Why? Because if I take uh, finally many elements in this union, then those finally many elements are in some uh, finite number of sets B. Okay, so just uh, the union of a finite number of Bs is another one of these linearly independent sets. And of course, if they're linearly independent, then the final new combination is zero if and only if all the scalars are zero. So you actually can check that this is an element, is in M. Okay? You have to check that. It's not done in the book, but I did it in the notes. Okay? Which I didn't copy for you today, but it's only this beginning anyway. I'll give that to you on Tuesday. Okay? So this is in M. Well, that's, some, that's uh, an upper bound, because all the Bs in this chain are obviously less than or equal to that. Okay? Every B in this chain was already covered, okay? So it's less than or equal to this union. So that's an upper bound. So the hypothesis is established. Therefore, the conclusion is there is a maximal element. Now, the, now prove that the maximal element spans all of X. Max, let uh, U, conclusion, U equals max element, exists. Suppose not. Suppose it's suppose span of U is not equal to X. Is not equal to X. Okay. Then you have an element. Okay, this is itself a vector space. The span of any collection. All possible. Uh, suppose Y equals this, which is itself a vector space is not equal to x. Well, then there's an element little x in capital X minus capital Y. This is all how they always work, okay? Then what will happen? Then there exists uh, little x in capital Y minus capital X, little x unequal to zero, and then the span of U union this element x, okay, is strictly bigger, bigger, unequal to the span of U. Okay? And that's a contradiction because U is maximal. There's not supposed to be anything bigger, right? Okay. <laughs> so, therefore, you have this, uh, every <coughs> vector space as a Hamel basis. So that's the style of how this Thorns lemma gets working in terms of set inclusion. You'll see this again, and then they do it again for uh, total, ordinal, total orthonormal sets. Every uh, Hilbert space has a total orthonormal set. We can actually construct it by induction in cases of separable Hilbert space. That was the exercise that I said we skipped in section 3.5 or something, 3.6. Okay. Okay. So... Uh, we'll use it one more time when we go to the Hanbonic theorem. So we're going to steam ahead. That takes a, there's some computation in sections 4.2 and 4.3 that's going to take us a little bit of time, so I will easily use up those, those, those lecture hours. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. I'll try to fill it in with some more examples if I can. Yeah. All right, thank you.